here at Mountain View Baptist Church. Welcome if you're a first time visitor, we're happy that you're here today, and we're pleased that you've come. Welcome if you're a regular attender. It's a great thing to be here together, see you this morning. And if you're joining us online, we welcome you as well. This is a great place to be today. Great place to be for two categories of people. One, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's a great place to be because nothing's better than being with other saints Amen. and worshiping God in corporate worship. And it's a great place to be if you're a seeker, you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, because we believe it's here that you can find truth and answers to life's questions above any other place that you could go. As Pastor Kevin shares a message this morning from the Bible, we pray that the gospel, which means good news, will become clear to you as it never has before. If you have questions after the service, you can meet with someone, you can gather together as we have tea, and ask more questions. We're happy to answer them and to be here for you. This morning's reading is from Psalm 32. If you'd like to read along, I'll give you a moment. Psalm 32 is entitled, Blessed Are the Forgiven. And David is the writer. You know, David, like us, had a need for forgiveness. We know all the things that happened in his life, right? He was an adulterer. He set up his companion in adultery's husband to be killed. Yet God said at the end of his life that he was a man after my own heart. Why is that so? It's because of the goodness of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. So let's read together Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's pray. Dear God, you are the creator of all things, Lord. You gave us life today, even. And Father, as we just read, you also look upon our transgressions, God. And only when we ask, only when we come to you, may we be forgiven, Lord, and may we be released from the burden of sin, Father. Thank you for making it heavy upon us, Lord, that we seek you. God, forgive us our sins today, Lord. Give us hearts for you. May it be said of us that we were men and women after your own heart, Lord God. May confession and thanksgiving be a hallmark of our lives, God. May we just reach to you, Lord, for the forgiveness that only you can offer, God. For those of us who don't know you today, Lord, draw us to you, God, as your grace and your mercy, Lord, is poured upon us, Lord. Thank you for that. 
Thank you that we can have reconciliation, that we can come to you through Jesus, God, and you made that. For us, you created that ability for us to know you, God, when we were running in our own ways, God. Just open our eyes today to know you, to hear from you, God. Today, some of us aren't with us today, God. Some of our body is not here because they are sick and ill, Lord. Or maybe even they have um, visitors, Lord God. I pray that they will know and they will feel your presence, God. That they will know we miss them. That, Father, you will strengthen them who are weak. Father, those who are ill, Lord. God, lift them up. Report it and with it, Lord. I pray you will heal his body. That his time in the hospital will be free for him. That he'll regain strength and that Jenny would also, Lord, be comforted by your hand, Lord, and give her endurance for this journey, Lord. And for the <coughs> baptisms this morning, God, thank you that you called us into obedience to walk with you, to, to follow after your example. Lord God, may this be a time for those who are baptized of just joy, God, just overflowing joy. May it serve as a strong witness in their lives, God, to your love for them and your redemptive nature, God, and your love for us. Grow them in the strength of your love. Give them enduring faith, <coughs> Lord God. And for those young people that are and the families here at Mountain View, God, the temptations, the struggles are real in their lives, God. At school, at home, when they were friends, God, just strengthen them, God. Give them an enduring faith, Lord. Open their eyes fully to your goodness, Lord, and give them a vision for a life well lived for you, God. Give them, Father, hearts that want to be pure, God. Give them extraordinary ability to resist temptation, Lord, that they will live a life with few regrets, God, that they might be faithful to you, Lord. Help them to walk through these cultural challenges that they have, God, and understand, Lord, how they might bless up you in their lives. And give us all courage to proclaim your good news, your gospel, Lord, to those who desperately need you, Lord, to the world that's out there looking for so many different things in so many different ways. And it all really comes back to the satisfaction they're missing in knowing you, God. Just help us to be proclaimers of your truth, Lord, and of your love, and may we model it in our lives. In Jesus' name.
<laughs> very well done. Um, a couple things I failed to announce. One is that the children will stay in the service today, right? It's a different kind of service. So after we pray in a moment, um, uh, Pastor Kevin is going to uh, deliver a message after a song. But then after the message, we're going to have a baptism. So that's why this pool is open back here. And, and I just pray that it stays a safe zone. It makes me a little nervous. When I see it, I think, ah, there's going to be a video camera somewhere. We're going to see it fail. So let's just pray to hunt. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing another song, and then Pastor Kevin's going to bring the message. So let's, let's pray together. Lord God, um, as I sing these songs, Father, as we sang, and we sang of God, just how we will sing of your majesty and of your goodness, Lord, and how you are greatly to be praised. I was just reminded how many generations, Father, of people sang these songs to you. God, how they stood before you as we did this morning and they sang praises to you, God. We praise you that you are an enduring and loving God, that we can trust you, Father, that you are a rock upon which we can count, Lord God, through this life of ups and downs. And I pray, Lord, as we prepare to hear your word, Lord, that you would open our eyes, God, only your Holy Spirit can open our minds and our hearts to accept and to understand the words that you have for us, God, to change us, to make us, Father, more like you, to bring us into relationship with you through Jesus, Father. Thank you for that opportunity. Close out any distractions that we came in here with today, that you give us focus upon you and your word, open our hearts and our minds. Give Pastor Kevin the words, Father, anoint him in a way that he brings truth, God, and he speaks boldly your message of hope, of salvation, of grace, of mercy, and of love, Lord. May this time together bring glory to your holy name, Lord, and it may help, and may it help us to glorify you in everything that we do. Thank you that we have hope in you, and thank you that we can come to you boldly before your throne of grace in Jesus name
as we have a, a baptism service. Now, there's a lot of water around at the moment. There's water behind me either, as, uh, as uh, uh, Kent uh, rightly pointed out. It's a bit nervy when the worship team stands up there. Um, as I said, to check with Lynn, I'm assuming it's a good little case it falls in, whether we need to dive in after him, we should be he's okay. And, uh, but there's a lot of water around. Uh, uh, it's some, something strange, isn't it? It's like water in a church service. Uh, it's, that's the Baptist version of synchronized swimming or something that goes on. I don't know what, we, uh, what you think of it. But uh, our country has endured a lot of, on a more serious note, uh, a lot of water at the moment. Uh, I don't know if you've been following the news, there have been floods all over the country, even now, uh, Madagascar and, and uh, Mozambique particularly hit quite hard with uh, Cyclone uh, Freddy. Uh, the Vol Dam is currently 100 and Last time I checked, 119% full. Uh, the Blumhoff Dam is 109% full. And uh, if you know anything about maps, you know that's not a good thing. If you get to 100%, that's full. Uh, they have all 12 sluices open on the Blumhoff Dam, and even that cannot cope with, uh, uh, with the water that's flowing through. They are releasing 3,200 uh, metric uh, uh, tons of water per second out of the dam. That is a lot of water uh, flowing out of the dam. So we're actually quite concerned about the vault dam because they couldn't open some of the sluices that hadn't been maintained and they were actually worried about the impacts being the dam burst. Now some fun facts, uh, we have some rather large man-made dams in our continent just here in Southern Africa. Uh, one of the bigger ones is Kahora Massa Dam in Mozambique. You might be aware of that dam. It's 292 kilometers long. Uh, that, is a, that is a big dam. Uh, it's 38 kilometers wide. It has a surface area of 2,700 kilometers square kilometers. It is 157 meters deep. And uh, it is a hydroelectric dam, like our Stiembras dam, and uh, able to, when it's working, generates uh, 2,400 megawatts of electricity from that dam when the turbines are working. For that in perspective, Kubu can only generate 1,800 megawatts. The flight shows from zero to 1,800 as we are all too aware. But when both reactors are working, we can generate 1,800 megawatts, uh, whereas the water in Kohora Kor is 2,400. Kariba Dam, many of you will know that. Uh, it's nearly 300 kilometers in length. It's even longer. Uh, it's 32 kilometers wide. It's wider. Its surface is 5,400 kilometers square, but it only has a maximum depth of 97 meters. It took 10,000 men uh, to uh, build the dam wall. And uh, another fun fact, that's where I proposed to my wife to marry me. And I think it was the heat and the mosquitoes, she agreed. <laughs> and, uh, but it was at uh, a little town called Siobonga, the town much like Chizini that was built to build the Kariba Dam Wall. It took that 10,000 men 4,000 years, uh, 4, uh, it took 10,000 men four years uh, to build the dam. And 87 of them lost their lives in the process. So four of them are still buried in the concrete in the dam wall. It's, one, uh, it's, it's 128 meters high. 579 meters wide. That is very impressive. When you stand there, if you've ever stood there, I've stood at the bottom and at the top of the Jasini Dam wall, and it's huge. You feel like a little ant when this huge wall, you know, behind that wall is this massive wall of water. It is very impressive what man can do when he applies himself. And all of this is very interesting. But unless you've stood there, unless you've experienced one of these dams, all these fun facts that I give you, it's just interesting information. Unless you've really been there and seen how huge they are and how dwarf we are by it, when the, when the sluice gates are open, the ground actually rumbles with the force and the, the thunder of, of the water. It's quite deafening. They stand as giant monuments of what man can do, how we can subdue nature and how we can harness it for our own good. And yet there is still a concern that dams can, and they do, burst at times. Even this week with the Vol Dam, there are some serious concerns about its integrity and whether it will be able to withstand all the water. They rise, water rises, and they are, are vulnerable to all kinds of geological and seismic activity and structural failure. And so dams do fail 
even at our best, even at our greatest achievements, we are constantly reminded that we are still small and limited in terms of the forces of nature that are around us. If you come to our passage this morning, it paints a, a far greater, far more superior picture of our Lord. Far greater than anything we could accomplish, anything we could build, anything we could do as, as, as in our best efforts as mankind, God stands and reigns victorious and is superior over all. If you hear nothing else this morning, hear that. God is supreme and superior over all. And that is the picture we have here of our Lord. A God who never fails. A God who is supreme. A God who is not small or limited or somehow has some, some inadequacy in one way or another. And this passage connects the power of God, of who He is, connects it to us. And how it is, how we can relate to this awesome, magnificent Father whom we call our Father. It's nice to know, and then you found those facts rather interesting this morning. It's nice to have those useful facts and statistics, but unless you personally experience it yourself, you've never really experienced it at all. It's nice to have all these interesting facts about God and, and what He's done and, and what He can do, but unless you know Him personally and you have personally experienced Him in your life, it has no impact on you. It fails to leave you breathless in awe and wonder and, and of worship of our Lord. Unless you've been and seen those games, you can't appreciate what they are about. I don't know how to relate to this. I know many of you are city slickers, maybe you've never seen one of those games. It's like walking past a coffee shop, smelling the coffee and then keep going. Does that help pull it? Does that help pull it? Uh, it was a very uh, absolute coffee. But uh, um, it's like, it's, it's, you can smell the coffee, but unless you drink it, you've never really experienced it. Unless you've experienced the Lord Jesus Christ personally in your life, you have not experienced Him at all. You might know well about Him, but you do not know Him personally. There is no greater honor. No greater achievement that anyone can make than to know Jesus Christ personally. The, 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 the most life-changing discovery that you can make is discovering Jesus Christ. And this is what, what verse 2, if you go back, back up in chapter 2 a little bit and go back to verse 2, this is what Paul had in mind when he said, In him the, all the full riches of complete understanding and you know the mystery of God namely Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There is no greater treasure, there is no higher accomplishment in this life than knowing Jesus. But for the Bible, when it comes to the Bible, the Bible is not written for our curiosity or our amusement. It's not for our information, but it is for our transformation. That's what the Bible is about. That's what the Bible is for. It's not just a textbook to be studied and to be known in terms of intellectual understanding. You can't negate that, but it's not, it doesn't end there, does it? If it doesn't impact you personally, you do not know the one that the Bible is speaking about. Knowing here in this passage is not, when, when, when Paul writes about knowing this knowledge and knowing God and Him as all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, it is very personal, it's deeply personal. It's not a knowing about God, but knowing God personally. Do you know Jesus Christ this morning? That is the real question before us today. This is important because of everything that you know, and everyone that you know, no one comes close to comparison to the God that is described in this passage that I read for you this morning. No one comes close to the surpassing, nothing comes close to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. You might be a very clever person. You might be intellectually very capable, a very clever person, a doctor, maybe you've got titles and all kinds of letters after your name. You might be an engineer or a scientist, maybe very clever, and we respect that. But that does, is not what, that's what, not what defines you. That's not, who, that's not the most important thing that you need to know in this life. You might know somebody who's important. You may have met somebody who's very important. You may be somebody, a celebrity or somebody who's very in, and a very important person. 
but nothing compares, as we see in our passage this morning, to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ personally, of knowing Him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus, it tells us, is the fullness of God. He is not second in charge. He is not somehow lesser than God. He is fully God in every way. He is very God in every way, not lesser in any way. Who spoke creation into existence when the world was created with all these power and all these forces. I heard you this week that there's a, a black hole traveling through space that is the size of 20,000 suns. I can't comprehend that sort of information. I don't know what to do with that kind of information. I just hope it's not traveling towards us, otherwise, uh, that's the end of the world as we know it. But uh, God spoke creation to being in all these things into existence. And we know that Christ was the one. Let us create, it says in Genesis chapter 1. Jesus Christ was worthy of all our honor and all our worship. He is the great sovereign I am. He is totally sufficient, we see here. He is not in need, somehow inadequate in one way or another. He is not lacking or insecure in any way. He is all-knowing and capable of doing whatever he likes because he's God and he can. This is the God who has come to us in bodily form. This is the first verse I read. In him dwells a fullness of deity in bodily form. He's come to us in the person of Jesus Christ so that we can know and relate to him personally. Not just read interesting facts about him, but know him personally. It's like we've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, ex having experienced him personally because he has made himself known to us by relating to us as a man. And by taking on the bodily form and flesh, he could make atonement for our sins that was required in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. and by being our perfect substitute, by paying the ultimate penalty for our sins, by his bodily resurrection, we have hope of a new and eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. And this is the transformation that we're talking about, the transforming power of God that is at work in us, in Christ, too. That, 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 that transforming power gives us new life because he rose victorious over sin and death. So you can, in Jesus Christ, and know God personally. Because he is victorious over our sin and death. In verse 10 it says, In Christ you have been brought to fullness. That God that I've just spoken about, and I, you know, whenever I feel the need to, you know, I see come across a passage that describes God, like, like this particular passage, I always so feel so inadequate in terms of, of English vocabulary to describe who God is. That you feel that words are simply fall short to how do you describe God in, in, in all his fullness? And yet it relates that fullness of God to us, that he has brought us to fullness. The fullness of God has come down in Jesus Christ, and in Christ he says, you have now been brought to fullness. So, so you can have the fullness of Christ when you are in Christ. Christian believers are, are described in, as being in Christ. That's a Another way, there's, there's a few terminology, believers, Christians, uh, children of God, uh, or people who are in Christ. There's, that's what a person who's put their faith in Jesus is described as in the Bible, and it describes us as being in Christ. Christian believers, that's our place, and that's how we are described as being in Christ. If you want to know more about that, perhaps it helps to go and read uh, Exodus chapter 32 and how uh, Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock. That's what it means, that's being hidden in Christ. When God passed by, it would be destroyed without that provision of the Lord in that, in that cave where he could hide. Don't read Exodus 32. I don't have time this morning to go into the whole story about that. But that's this idea that we are covered. We are hidden in Him. We are secure in Christ through the provision of God. Thanks to God for that. But what is this fullness that we talk about here? Uh, our lives are, are, in one way, it means that our lives are filled with the attributes of God. That, that the attributes of God and now come to us. We become more like Jesus. That's what the fullness of God is that has come to us. 
The fullness of his love. Children of God can experience that. The fullness of his power. Always limited as human beings because we still this side of glory. But we have the fullness of peace and joy. We can know it as the spirit of Christ lives in us. And so living in such fullness of Christ also means that you live in obedience to God as Christ did. Because part of the fullness of Christ is obedience, isn't it? Jesus wasn't just loving and kind and joyful and, and, and merciful. He was also obedient. I told the fact that he was obedient even to death on the cross. Even death on the cross. He was cruel and despised form of death. Jesus willingly died for you. That is obedience. That's the, that's the, the pinnacle of obedience. Obedience even to death. Fullness in Christ means that you are also fully equipped to serve and able to approach His throne of grace in worship. Jesus is the head over every power, it tells us here, and authority. But not everyone obeys the head and follows. So yes, He is head over every power and authority. When we read a passage like that, Maybe you think to yourself, then, then why does the world look like it does? Why is evil so prevalent? Why do every day we seem to hear news reports of things that make you shudder? Uh, as as we, we hear of things that I wouldn't even mention, it's too shameful to mention what the what the wicked do. Every day we, we see evil in our world and we see the brokenness of our world. So how then is Jesus the head over every power and authority. Just because there is power and authority there doesn't mean everybody lives under that power and authority. Just because we have electricity doesn't mean the lights will be turned on. Just because we, it's so easy to use, electricity jokes to not even know, but uh, just because we have these things doesn't mean we make use of them. Just because there are laws in our land and authorities in our land, as we know so well, to uphold and to enforce the laws, this doesn't mean everyone follows the rules. You might be head of your home, that doesn't mean the home acknowledges your headship or follows you. Some of you are in unchristian homes. Your home, you're the only one who's a Christian. And just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that they recognize the authority that has been given to you in Christ. It's only with the new life in Christ and the, the fullness in us that we begin to obey Him instinctively and follow Him. That we are brought then into a new covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, as we see in Colossians chapter 2. And he, and he touches on this thing of circumcision. Whereas in the Old Testament, circumcision was a sign of the, the old covenant that was made with Abraham and performed by fallen human beings, uh, now every believer is in Christ and in the new covenant through his blood, which is the cross. This is this is your who you are, that you also tell us in this living, with circumcision, not with the circumcision performed by human hands, but by Christ himself. This, this is a spiritual circumcision of the heart, not a physical bodily circumcision performed by man, but a spiritual one. That has been performed by Christ. Circumcision was a picture of what was coming, what they ate. Circumcision was a ritual that involved the cutting away of flesh according to the Old Testament covenant. But now in the New Testament covenant, it involves Christ himself who, cut, who cuts off the whole part of you that was ruled by sinful flesh. It is removed, it's cut off from you. There is no greater picture of this than what we find in baptism, which is the visual imagery of, as it says in 12, verse 12, having been buried with Christ uh, Jesus with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in God's work. You were buried with Christ, uh, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in God's work. Answers. You will see, you go down into the water as if you're going into a watery grave. And there's a powerful portrait of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then personally of our own death, our spiritual deaths 
to sin and to self, and then being raised again, and coming up as a picture of Christ's resurrection. And of course, the imagery is so full of the washing away of sins, not a physical washing away, but of our spiritual sins that are a picture of that those have been washed away. And it is a reminder that you will always say things go according to plan, Candidates, I'll bring you back up again. And um, uh, it has happened where, uh, where people have actually uh, uh, had trouble around this area. Uh, but so far, so good. I've never had that myself. So, uh, but the reminder is also that we will be raised with Christ through faith in God's Word, raised in Jesus Christ from the dead, as this God who we have spoken about. The sovereign, the sovereign power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead raises us up. What a powerful image that is. But how this eternal, magnificent God has brought us new life. <coughs> he, died to, he raised us from the dead by faith in Him. And so baptism is a visual reminder of the gospel, of the gospel truth. In verse 13, that we were dead in our sins. That is, as you know, a dead person can do nothing to save themselves because we, all we had was the flesh. There was no spiritual life. We were dead in sin. We were helpless to save ourselves. Dead people can't bring themselves back to life. What is necessary is outside intervention, and that's exactly what God did by sending His Son. External intervention to raise us from the dead through His own death and resurrection. Now what comes next in verse 13 is as bold a declaration as you get in the Bible and the clearest gospel manifesto but God. We were dead in our sins and our transgressions but God. But if that does, exclamation mark. Go right across the page and exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. But God. God intervened in our lives and verse 13 says that made you alive with Christ by forgiving us all our sins. Praise God uh, for that. Every charge of sin, everything you've ever done, thought, acted on, didn't do, should have done, every charge of sin that the law could have brought against us and did bring up against us, we were legally indebted to the Old Testament law to pay back for the wrong that was done or God would not be just God would not be holy and pure. Our sins stood against us and condemned us because God is just. But God in His Son, the top verse 13, has made us alive with Christ by forgiving our sins. Praise God for His work in doing that. God in His Son, Jesus Christ, took that charge away, as it says, and nailed it to the cross in the bodily person of Jesus Christ. Our debt has been paid in full by Jesus Christ. Every force of evil and every power and every authority that was at work in you and ruled your life has now been disarmed and rendered powerless. Praise God for that. I don't know where all the amens are. You're welcome to say amen if you feel the they are visibly, the told, humiliated by God publicly. It's a public humiliation as Christ was hung on the cross, publicly humiliated by his resurrection. He proved to publicly humiliate all the powers and authorities and, the, and all the charges that were, 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 were charged against us. They, they were visibly humiliated by God in public, by the public execution of Jesus Christ. Who made a public spectacle of them. They thought that they had Jesus, didn't they? They thought they had accomplished, mission accomplished, when he died on the cross and when they buried him in the tomb. They thought their work was done. They had done what they had set out to do all. The darkness came over the whole land. Evil forces of darkness thought they had done and succeeded. They had killed the Son of God, done what they thought that they, had, they needed to do in order to end God's plan of salvation. They thought they had Jesus in checkmates. Master stroke by putting him to death, the Son of God, but it backfired when he rose from the dead victoriously. Death could not hold him and the grave could not keep him. God triumphed, triumphed over them by the cross. Baptism is a public 
it, 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 exhibition. It is a public thing that we do that we believe by faith in Jesus Christ in the finished work of God on the cross. And it personalizes it to us. Those individuals, and any of you who have been baptized here, those who have been baptized, those who have been baptized, are making a public declaration. I am his. The gospel is true of me. I have come to believe. I've read in God's word, and I believe it to be true. What God has done for me, and I am his. And I believe, and I am in Jesus Christ. Complete and full and I will follow him, my Lord, all the days of my life, even beginning with baptism. This was only possible, and is only made possible because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross for us. We go into the waters of baptism, and by so doing, we know we follow the example of Christ Jesus, who himself was baptized. And we show that we are in the water as we are in Christ in every way, in suffering, in death, and in life, we are in Christ. Those of you who are going to get baptized, you're welcome to go and get yourselves ready and um, put on your, your outfits. You just go now and while I wrap up here. Finally, baptism is an act of obedience. We are, are told to repent and be baptized as a testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel is personalized. It is symbolic of the death of the old life of sin and being raised to new life in Christ Jesus. Once I was lost, but now I am found. Once I was blind, but now I am now I see. Once I was dead, but now I am alive. Perhaps you this morning have felt challenged by this message. Challenged in a good way. Felt rather uncomfortable because you recognize that's me. I have never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I've never put my faith and trust in Him to be saved. I've never believed in Him like this. No about Him. I grew up in a Christian home, or whatever your, 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 your life story might be, but I've never made Him mine. I walked past every time. Every time I've gone to a church service, every time I've been to a wedding or a funeral, and I've heard a message from the Bible, I've just passed it by. Today the Lord is stopping you and saying no more. Go no further and has stopped you as you've heard the word of God. If you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be saved, please, even as Ken said in that, as he led the service, please come and speak to us that you can make right with the Lord today. You do not know what this day holds for you. You do not know if even another day has been granted to you. Make right with the Lord today. You never know when you're going to have to stand and give an account to the Lord for your life, for all your sin, for all the things you've ever done. And if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, all those charges will be brought against you and you will have no defense. In Christ Jesus, we have an advocate, as we saw in 1 John last week. We have an advocate who stands in our defense, who has forgiven us all our sins if we put our faith and trust in Him. That's the key to receiving the power of God, the new life, the transforming power of God that brings about new life. If that is you this morning, please make right with the Lord today. Make, make, uh, make, make that step of faith. Take that step of faith and trust in Him to be saved. If that makes sounds a little abstract, philosophical, come and speak to me afterwards that I can explain to you and try and help you to understand the gospel and, and how you can put your faith in Him. If you're here and you've never been baptized and you feel you would like to get baptized, I'm not going to let the water out just yet. And um, there's nothing special about this water. It's not water from pop down from the Jordan River or uh, <laughs> it's not holy water. There's nothing in a sense special about this. It's ordinary. We have the environment. This is groundwater, so we're not wasting water. Uh, but it is uh, ordinary water. What's significant in this is the people who will go through the waters of baptism what they have decided and what they are doing. That's the true significance of baptism. That they have decided to follow Jesus. They put their faith and trust in Him to be saved. And now they want to follow Him in obedience and be baptized as a public witness, a public spectacle. They don't make a spectacle of themselves yet. But they're going to make a spectacle of themselves here today as Jesus did on the cross, a public spectacle. 
as Jesus was hungry, God uh, visibly humiliated all the forces of evil and darkness through the execution of Jesus Christ. Let's bow heads. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for your work in these these two individual lives, Lord. You know, there's others who will be baptized later, uh, just weren't quite uh, ready just yet. And uh, Lord, we just pray that if there are others, Lord, maybe here today who felt convicted, convinced what they have heard from your word, that today they would make right with you, Lord God. Perhaps there's some of us, Lord, who have made right with you some time ago, but we still know. We still need to obey you and go into the waters of baptism. I pray, Lord God, that you give them the faith and the courage to take that step of faith and to be baptized as a public witness, a public declaration of the decision that they have made. Thank you, Lord, for each one here today, Lord. Thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for the great encouragement it is to every one of us who is in Christ when we feel despondent about our about our lives, about things not going the way we want them to, things we see in our lives that we, we have perhaps are left disappointed in ourselves uh, by the things we do and say. Thank you for the grace that is so sufficient, so abundant, so, so at work in each of us. Thank you for the transforming power that is at work in us, not was at work, but is and will, will always will be at work in us. Thank you for your grace and mercy to forgive all our sins, Lord God. Thank you for your, your work within us, Lord, in bringing about the changed life, the fullness of Christ that is on offer to us, that we have received and that we are experiencing every day. Thank you for what you're doing in us. Thank you for what you've done in us. And thank you, Lord, for what you are still going to do in each of us. We so look forward to this great uh, work of Christ in each of us. In every area where we know it's needed. So, Lord, bless you, Lord. bless these two individuals, we pray, and uh, as, we, as we go down to song, Lord, may you be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Could you stand and we're going to sing? Thanks, Shane, and the team, to lead us in place.
must be an electrocuted in the back. <laughs> so, tell me these are all connected up to the DB board, which I know I can't be a good thing. Uh, well, here we are. Uh, we have two very nervous individuals uh, in front of us here today. It's, uh, this is Reynolds and Chantay. And uh, would you guys come up here? Yeah, would you stand? Yeah, I know this is a big, uh, this is difficult for you. If you have a cell phone, please don't feel uh, shy to take a photograph. Just stand behind the stage here, yeah? so people can see you. This is Reynolds and Chantay, Michaels, and I'm going to uh, read them their testimony. When, uh, read their testimony for you. Whenever I tell, we go through the whole baptism thing and what to do and how, what it is, what it involves. The most nerve-wracking part for all of them is always insistently the testimony part. The talking and sharing their testimony. And, uh, and I understand that it's not easy to speak in public. So they have asked if I can please read their testimonies mm -hmm. from me. But this is it. Uh, this is Reynold Michaels. I am 30 years old. I grew up in what I believe to be a very Christian household. When I became a teenager, I started to rebel against my parents. I started smoking and drinking at a very young age. I was rebellious and disobedient, but he was merciful through all of that. God brought me out of all those rebellious ways before I turned 19 years old. I then tried to live the way my parents had taught me, although it was very works-based and not a gospel-centered lifestyle. As I grew older, I started to question a lot of things my parents had taught me based on God's word. I started to listen to other people's teachings, but still not wanting to let go of what I was brought up in. After my wife and I had moved away from our family, God slowly started to draw me away from my old ways and to his ways. For the past three years, God has brought me closer to himself. A year ago, I heard the gospel properly for the first time. The reason it took me so long is because I had held on to my old beliefs for so long and I only completely let go of it when I joined Mountain View Baptist. Now I love my life now I live my life bringing honor and glory to God. My life is not perfect now, but I know my salvation is secure in him who lived the perfect life I could not. And I want to be baptized because I want to be obedient to God's word. And it's great. And uh, Reynolds, uh, if you want to come join me here at the water. Mm. First, I want to read for us this, this, uh, this morning. Uh, it is, uh, it's in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. I'll take that off, it's fine. Uh, it says there, all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into death. Uh, we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. Face that way. So, Dan, you want to come stand here so you can watch? <laughs> there you go. Then uh, have you repented of your sin before God? And have you placed your trust in Him and Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and received Him for forgiveness of your sins? Based on your testimony of repentance and of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and at your own request, and I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
not nearly as warm as it looks. <laughs> Interesting, in the, the Jewish mitzvahs, the ceremonial baths, you enter in one area and you exit another. That's not the way we do it. We do this way pragmatically. It's just the way it works for us. Uh, but the, the symbolism is that you, you come in and you leave a changed person, a different person. Uh, we know that God is the only one who can change somebody, not the waters of baptism, uh, uh, not a pool, but we certainly believe that, that, uh, that God changes us. Shantae, based on, on what we have heard, uh, have you repented of your sin before God? And have you uh, placed your faith and trust in Him to be saved? And you want to get baptized? <laughs> you hear that? Based on your on your testimony of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, uh, baptized in the name of the Father, if you need, the Son. Bless them, Lord, we pray. Continue to bless their marriage, to grow them as a couple, and to use them greatly for your kingdom and your renown. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing one more song now, and then it's going to the service for us. Thank you for joining us. And the Lord bless you, and bless the rest of your life. Stand and sit. Thank you. I didn't read Shantae's testimony. Maybe he just pointed it out. Thank you. So please be seated. I do want to read this. I'd love to see it. Sorry about that. I'm chicken here. You just stay right there. Okay. Just thank the Lord that there are people around you to keep you on your toes and eh? keep, you, keep you away. My name is Shantae Michaels. As, um, I'm 27 years old. I grew up in what I believe to be a Christian home. As a family, we were always in church and thought that, that what it meant to be, I thought that that's what it meant to be a Christian. I had no sense of what sin was, uh, just disobedience. But when I had got older, uh, a lot happened in my life. And that, I would, that if I were to tell you about it today, everything, uh, it would take up the whole day. But it had caused me a lot of severe depression and a lot of self-hurt against my own body and the precious life that God gave me. But by, the, by His grace, I am still here. In 2014, a friend had invited me to a half a charismatic church and it was like something I had never seen before. It was at this place that I first heard the term being born again, and soon I thought I gave my life to Christ, but never ever heard the gospel. I was still living a sinful life, and still a very lost life. In 2018, I married my husband, and adopted his family's beliefs. It was a very works-based life, and yet still not gospel-driven. But God carried me through. As we moved away from my husband's family, God started to draw us closer to him, and it was after my grandma's passing in 2021 that I really started seeking God in my lowest time. I came across the video of by Ray Comfort, and this was the first time I had heard the gospel being presented. While I was still skeptical, I opened the Bible, and as I looked through it, uh, through that very Bible, everything that the preacher had said was underlined in it, and the gospel was written in the very back. Mm. And then, so as I'm saying, I, will, I still struggle to let go of my workspace ways until I came across Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. For by grace you are saved, through faith and not by yourself. It is, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any, lest any man should boast. Another verse that helped me understand was Romans 10, verse 9 to 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with thy heart man believes unto righteousness, and with thy mouth confession is made 
unto salvation. As a new creature in Christ, my life has now changed. Yes, I still struggle with temptation and sin, but the feeling of being lost and alone are no longer there because mm. He was with me. I now want to live my life giving all glory to Him, who is my Savior. I want to be baptized because now that I fully understand salvation, I want to obey God's word in every part of my life. Mm. That's it, TC. Praise God for His being. Thank you.